Thanks. Okay, then officially welcome to today's uh, meetup that has the title Horizontal Scaling, uh, which is yeah the, the 1.8 release that we released today, or we released the release candidate today. And really today is going to be just about deploying VV8 in a cluster in a horizontally scaled fashion uh, on, a, on a Kubernetes cluster. And uh, the last meetup that we had was a lot of theory, and no, sorry, the last meetup that I held was a lot of theory sort of around all the, the architecture um, that makes up VV8. And today is sort of the, the counterpart to that. Like um, we have taken all of that architecture and we have put it into VV8 and now we just want to want to use it. So today also marks, uh, the, as I just said, the, the uh, day that we released the 1.8 uh, release candidate, uh, which is, I think, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, uh, uh, pull request that we merged on VV8 so far. So 115 um, commits there uh, over three months in the making. Uh, yeah, lots of lots of effort, lots of, of help from, from a lot of people, very cool stuff in it. And something that I'm also super proud of is we when we started our, our architectural roadmap, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, one thing that we said is that we will release this by the end of Q3, and today is September 30th. And hey, we actually made that. And when that, when does that ever happen in, in software development that you estimate a date and um, yeah, and it actually works out. So um, let me quickly, as I said, today is going to be mostly sort of very practical, but I want to very quickly sort of recap, um, which is I don't know, six slides or so, a very quickly recap where we are on that, that roadmap. So we started. Um, the first thing was was just improving uh, the performance of our HNSW implementation that we had way back in, in version 1.4. Um, and then uh, we implemented the LSM tree storage, which made importing a lot faster because um, actually both of those releases made importing a lot faster. Uh, but 1.5 was sort of the, the point where we said like, yeah, um, writing is no longer the bottleneck. And, and this is sort of the, the start to our scaling roadmap because we said uh, scaling horizontally uh, only makes sense if what we're scaling is already efficient, because otherwise, well, what what good is it running on five nodes if you could get the same performance out of a single node? So that's how we started this roadmap, um, saying sort of, yeah, first we want to get the max out of a single node, and then we want to scale um, horizontally. For that, uh, we had the uh, sharded indices milestone, which was completed sometime in August, uh, but it wasn't actually released yet, mostly because the added value of um, sharding your indices really only becomes apparent when you have an actual cluster, uh, which is the current milestone. Today, we released 1.8, uh, 1 um, or the release candidate for uh, 1.8, which has horizontal scaling. Uh, in in, um, in uh, parentheses here, without replication, that's the next step on the roadmap. And I'll get to the, the differences, what that means in a second. Um, yeah, so so this roadmap is still ongoing, but today um, we have the, the first release that is horizontally scalable and replication and dynamic scaling is coming a bit later then. So yeah, uh, that brings me to, to talking quickly about uh, sharding versus replication and maybe the limitations that we have here. And that is also a perfect point to switch over to our docs, which have also been updated uh, for the release. So I'm on the if you start out, uh, you end up on the, the current release. I'm on the, the 1.8 release already, which, because it's just a release candidate, you get this, this warning, uh, warning here. Um, yeah, we've revamped this page, and there's a lot more. I'm not going to go into this into to detail now, but um, there's a nice new, new overview about the architecture. And we have a whole new section about scaling. And in here, we have sort of the, the two major motivations of um, why you would want to scale your, your BB-8 cluster. Um, the first one, and this is sort of the one that I'm, I'm mostly going to be showing today, um, is if you want to have a larger data set size than a single node can fit, um, the motivation is basically to shard your data set onto multiple nodes. And then essentially, if um, yeah, if, if one node could only fit, I don't know. So, so today, an article came out by uh, one of our community members who is running, I think, 60 million objects, 60 million vectors on a single node. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that 60 million is the limit that one node could handle. Then you could add two nodes, and you could have 120 million, and and so on. So this is the the major motivation um, of sharding your data. The second motivation would be higher uh, query throughput. So if you have a single node, and let's say you can handle making this up completely a thousand queries per second on that single node, 
but your traffic increases, then the motivation would be to scale to match that, um, that higher throughput. And that is what will be uh, possible with replication. So this is something that's, that's important to know. As you shard your data set, you don't actually gain anything on the querying side, but you gain stuff on the importing side. So, so um, you have more resources to import. So that gets faster, uh, but not on query. With replication, that's going to be the other way around. And then the, the third one, which is also a benefit of replication, is high availability. So if you have your data set running on, um, yeah, let's say replicated on three nodes, if one of those nodes, nodes fail, then you can still um, uh, yeah, use the cluster normally. The only limitation is going to be that the throughput is slightly uh, lower, but uh, then you could scale sort of for uh, high availability. And we also have a summary of that uh, over here in that section where you can say advantages when increasing sharding, you can run larger data sets and you can speed up your imports. Um, the disadvantage is that even as you add more resources to your cluster, you don't actually improve the query side. And then the other way around for, um, for replication, um, the system becomes highly available and you can scale uh, your query side linearly, where the disadvantage is that even though you add more resources to your cluster, the import actually doesn't speed up because now it has to be imported or replicated onto uh, multiple nodes. So this is the the sort of intro to that. There's a lot more things that we can get into, but um, yeah, I wanted to tackle those as part of the, the live demo, which, yeah, which we'll dive right in basically. Um, so for the first part, let's, let's see, I have prepared a Kubernetes cluster um, and in there I've created a namespace and this namespace is currently completely empty. So if I look at all the resources in that, First connect always takes some time. Let's see if the cluster is still reachable. That would be nice. <laughs> oh, that does. Oh, <laughs> okay, that that really took long. I think subsequent queries yeah should be much faster. Um, yes. So I have a Kubernetes cluster, and this namespace is completely empty. And now I want to deploy VV8 into that namespace. For this, we have a new release of our Helm chart, which let me also show you that. Um, there we go. <laughs> helm is the, the German word for helmet. So I always get like these helmet things here, but I actually want the helm chart, uh, which has releases. So there we go. We have the, it's also release candidate because it points to the VV8 release candidate um, for 14, which works with horizontal scalability. So I've already downloaded that. So you can see here I have this, this VV8 PGZ, which is just the, the latest helm chart. And I have a very, very simple values YAML file. Um, which is basically meant to, to deploy this. So I'm overriding a few things. I'm overriding, well, actually, I don't even need to, to override this anymore because that's now part of the release that I had to during development. And I have replicas, and I actually want to start with a single replica. And then right here, this is uh, just some, some uh, firewall configuration. So I'm basically whitelisting my own IP address in the firewall. And uh, yeah, we're starting with a single replica, and this this is tiny. This is uh, not a size that makes a lot of sense in in uh, real life, probably with just two CPUs on a single node. But for now, for for demo purposes, that's absolutely that's absolutely perfect. So this is my values YAML, and I have a deploy script. It's almost almost doesn't make sense to call it a script because it's very simple. We're basically just running this uh, idempotent uh, command to upgrade in my namespace with that values YAML. Um, yeah, so, sorry, that's a the release name and down here is the, the namespace. So let me simply run this and we should deploy a VV8 cluster that currently has a single node. So ignore those warnings. I'm running with the, the GKE autopilot cluster. So basically as I deploy more stuff on that cluster, it automatically provisions uh, new infrastructure in the background, which is kind of cool actually. So if we look at the pods, so, so K is just an alias for, for kubectl, maybe easier to understand if they, actually type those out. Uh, so we have currently a single um, V8 node right here, which is currently being provisioned. As you can see container creating. So this is mostly just the Kubernetes cluster, which has to, to download uh, the image. So maybe just watch this. And it's, know, it's, actually, it's actually running already. So that's cool. So just to, to prove that this works, we can look at the service definition, and then here we see a service that has an external IP. We take a look at that. And now if I contact this, there, there we go. So this V8 instance is running. And right now it has a single node, which is not the point of this meetup. 
So let's take our values YAML. And as with any configuration that you change in um, your values YAML, that will be applied once you deploy it again. So let's say we go for three replicas, for example. So let's do that. And I'm just running my deploy script. Just a second. Clean that up. And now again, if we watch kubectl get pods, you will see that they are being created in a stateful set in a sort of ordinal fashion. So we're starting with the, the VB8 zero, and then uh, we're currently creating uh, instance VB8 one. And once that is done and ready, then it will create VB8 three. So let's just wait for that for a second. Something to note while these are, um, so you can see that one is pending right now. That's That means that the cluster needs to provision the infrastructure was, was very fast. Uh, one thing to note, about um, dynamic scaling. So as we said on the roadmap, dynamic scaling is actually not yet not yet present. So let me go to the roadmap. Yeah, dynamic scaling is actually the, the last point on the roadmap. So some things of dynamic scaling, so as you're seeing right now, I'm actually adding nodes when the cluster is already there. That already works, but there are some limitations. Basically, as a rule of thumb, if there's no data in the cluster yet, you can do whatever you want. If there is data in the cluster and you increase its size, that works. However, if you um, th there's basically no way yet to, to drain a node or to tell a node that is being decommissioned and that whatever load is on the node should be moved to a different node. So that is something that will come in the, in the uh, dynamic scaling milestone. So basically, if you have data imported on a three node cluster and you reduce it to two nodes, uh, that, that will break at the moment because that's yeah, not, not the dynamic scaling part yet. Um, but coming back to, to um, our cluster, which is now ready. So that was basically all we had to do. And we see all of this is ready. And of course, you don't have to worry about something like uh, such as load balancing because it's running on Kubernetes. So the service that we have in front of it will already uh, load balance across those three uh, VV8 nodes. They're, they're pods in Kubernetes speak and in VV8 speak, they're, they're nodes because they're not tied to, to Kubernetes. That just makes it much easier. So if we get that service again, here it has that external IP. And that basically has the load balancer in front of it. So if we contact it again, well, there's nothing in it yet. So if we look at, for example, the schema, you can see right now it's empty. So let's import something into that. Uh, let's get started with, we have the, um, news publication data set. It's a very simple data set. Um, we run that also in our in our documentation with slightly different configuration, but that doesn't matter. Uh, but we can just use that and we can just import it. So let me just quickly import that. That is Python 3 import that and then I always need to check what the order is. VV8 URL first. Give that one. Cache here is cache English and batch size. I don't know. Let's go for something like 128. Okay, so that is running, that is importing. Okay, now I need a different uh, terminal tab here. Um, so now what we can do, let's, I wanna show something. Um, let's quickly look at the schema that we have. Yeah, schema is there, cool. And I know that one of the classes in that schema is called article. So let me take a look at this one. We maximize this. So here you see a different difference to previous VV8 versions. First of all, we have this whole uh, sharding config thing that didn't exist before. But more importantly, I didn't change anything about my import script. This is exactly the same import script that we have been running um, on, yeah, on, on regular VV8 instances. But you can see that it set the desired count and also the actual count uh, for shards to three. So the desired and actual count at the moment is always the same because um, yeah, shards are basically, the, or the creation of shards is basically atomic at the moment. Uh, in the future, this is going to be an async process with regards to, to replication, for example. So let's say you have um, replication factor of one, and then you set, you increase this to three replicas, then data has to be replicated from those one node uh, to the, the, the other nodes. So that, that is basically when that process becomes uh, asynchronous. Right now it's synchronous, so desired and actual is uh, the same. However, what I wanted to say is basically um, that, yeah, it, it automatically adjusted the amount of, of shards to my cluster size. And in the second demo that I'll show later, 
but we can also see that it doesn't have to be that way. You can also control this if you don't want to uh, set it to that size. Okay, ideally, I've been talking enough for this to, to finish. Yeah, that's cool. So um, let's take that URL and let's maybe just connect to that cluster. And for this, we can take the VV8 console. Yeah, that downgrades because it's not an HTTPS connection. Okay, still the same URL. Cool, so that should be, I probably have it in my history somewhere, but let's maybe just start from, from scratch. So let's just send a query, any kind of query as you're used to sending to VV8. So let's go for article and then we can go for a title and summary maybe. And then to make it interesting, let's set a limit and let's set a near text. So that basically means this is going to be a vector search because I'm running with the uh, contextionary. You can, of course, also run with transformers for simplicity's sake. So we don't need GPUs in this demo. I've just picked the contextionary, which works fine. And I've asked Bob before for an example uh, that because he uses this, this uh, data set a lot. And he said housing prices is one that that he typically uses. So let's go for a vector search of housing prices. Uh, the content itself doesn't actually matter just to, to sort of as a proof of concept. It does find uh, stuff relating to, to house it, uh, housing prices and uh, uh, housing shortages, uh, et cetera. So the vector search is working. Uh, the part that I want to show is basically if I run it again, it's still working. <laughs> and the, the interesting part here is because we're running with uh, three nodes in that cluster and we have a load balancer in front of it, we cannot predict which node is hit on that search. But if I run it again and again and again and again, it will always return the same results. So basically, no matter which shard we hit, whether that shard has all the data or parts of the data, Deviate internally makes uh, sure that it contacts all the other shards that, um, yeah, that, that have data or um, that it needs data from. And this is also why we said before in the limitations of sharding that the queries per second actually don't go up if you increase the, the amount of shard. Like even, even if for each new shard, you add a new physical node that has new hardware, um, because your data set is now spread onto different nodes, we, we don't know which node uh, contains your data. Um, and, and in this simple case, and this is maybe also a good point to, to talk about this, there are a few more other fields that we see here. Uh, so right now we are sharding on the key ID, which is the, with the underscore, this is the internal, or not, not the internal ID, but the, the ID, um, the, the UUID that every um, object in VV8 has. And we're currently uh, having a strategy, which means hash. So essentially we're, we're creating a hash from the ID. And then there's just a specific hash function. In this case, it's, it's a murmur three, and I think it's a 64 bit hash. The, Interesting part about this is, so, so right now this is fixed and this is actually immutable, um, but in the future, and this is why it's in the config, the plan is to um, open that up so that you could, for example, uh, set this to a different field. Um, one second. So, um, sorry. If, for example, you have a specific property in your data and you know that you usually set a where filter on a specific property, you could set that here and then you could already shard according to that. And then you could be in, the, in situations where basically a single shard can answer your uh, query. And then you do actually benefit from, from uh, sharding as well with regards to the throughput. Uh, in this case right now, because the IDs are basically meaningless from the perspective of such a, such a search, uh, right now, I just have to hit all three shards and basically combine the results. Um, okay, that speaking of combining results, that's basically the perfect segue into an aggregation. So let me aggregate an article again, and let's maybe start with just a count. Yeah, count count is also count is actually that interesting for what I wanted to show. Let me just quickly get this. What I wanted is, I think there's a property word count. Yeah, which is just an int. So this is not VV8 counting anything. This is just a property in that data set where each article has the specific word count set. And here, let's say we go for, I don't know, a maximum and a minimum. Um, so if we run that, so first of all, if I run it again, same results, and that's important because we never know which, which node is being, um, which node is serving that query basically. Um, yeah, so, so if we have something like a maximum or a minimum, 
that is easy to aggregate. Like one chart will say my highest number is, I don't know, 15,000. One chart will say my highest number is uh, 100. And the next one will say my uh, highest number is 16,852. Uh, 16, this is easy to aggregate. For maximum, we just pick the, the highest. For minimum, we pick the lowest, et cetera. If we go for something like a mean, the value becomes being an approximate value. So what we're doing in the case of the mean, for example, is we simply take the mean of each chart's result, which would be the real mean if um, data was perfectly evenly sharded, but in real life, it's, it's never gonna be perfectly even. So this is something you have to keep in mind if you're working on a sharded data set, the mean is going to be an approximate value. But yeah, the important thing is no matter which note you hit, you're always gonna get the, the real results. So let's come back here. This was the first demo, which was cool, but also only a tiny, tiny data set. So as we saw, what was it? Uh, no aggregate article meta count. You can see this is really just, just uh, 3,500 data points in this data set. So I also want to demo a second case with a larger data set. And especially on this one, I want to show you that um, as you add more shards and therefore add more resources to your cluster, um, you also increase the, the import speed. So for this, let me just switch my Kubernetes context to a second namespace, which I already prepared. And here I've already actually deployed VVA. And in this case, if we take a look, three attempts, if we look at this specific namespace, we can see that we actually have 12 VV8 nodes running. So they're still relatively small, but there's 12 nodes, just to show that, um, yeah, you can uh, scale them as you wish. There's also an importer job, which was still running from my test before. Let me quickly delete this, create it again. Um, so in this, in this cluster, um, I also have, so the same thing applies here. I also have a service here has a different IP. So just to show before we start, uh, not localhost, I'm so used to, to typing localhost. Um, if we look at the schema, this instance is currently empty. So if it has no schema, it also can't have any data because data is held in, in classes. So to show um, an import on a larger cluster, I have prepared a very simple import job, which runs a script. So let me go for this import. Oh, sorry, that is the wrong one. That is the wrong folder. Let me go for, uh, let me go for this Kubernetes job. Just the Kubernetes job. If you're, if you're uh, new to Kubernetes, a job is basically just a pod that just runs once, or if it's a cron job, then it runs like a cron job, but basically um, it's not like, it, once it finishes Kubernetes, doesn't make sure to restart it, which is, um, yeah, I'll post to a deployment or stateful set where if it goes down, Kubernetes should, make sure that it goes back up again. Uh, this script basically just randomly generates vectors or objects that have a, a, a vector attached to them, which is random. And I can just configure it. I can ask it to, to have this many dimensions. This is just where it should uh, set, send it to. Total size, which is currently set to 100,000. Batch size set to 1,000. And shards, which I'm going to set to one for the first example. So even though I have, so this is, I, I said this before, um, that uh, the, the shards are picked to the size of the cluster unless you explicitly configure them. So even though I have a 12 node cluster right now, I'm explicitly telling this class should only uh, be shard or should only have a single shard, which means it can only live on a single node. And I'm doing this on purpose so that we have a, a baseline comparison basically. So let me kubectl apply minus f import job that creates the job. And now if we look at our pods and we can see, oh, it's already running. That means it was scheduled on a node that already had the, the image locally. That's nice. So then we can just attach to the logs, which is, uh, let me type it out, kubectl logs minus f in the name of that thing. And then we can see it's currently importing. It's not super fast because of course these, these nodes are sized uh, very small. It only has, I think in this case, four CPUs, so two more than in my, my previous example. And as you can see, basically, as with any uh, data set in the beginning, the, the batches are basically artificially fast because there's no not much data import yet. 
Um, but as this imports, I think this will sort of eventually go to around five seconds or something per, per batch, and then it will stay relatively constant at, at that rate. Um, I'm not going to keep it running all the time um, because I think this job in total, I think it would take about, I don't know, in this single node, six to seven minutes or so to complete. Um, but what I want to do is connect to that VV8 instance and just show you that stuff is happening just to sort of show that it's, um, yeah, not just printing random stuff, but actually importing something. So let's log out here. Let's log out into, uh, log in into this one. And then let's run a simple aggregate query. Call the demo class. Yeah, let's just count it. And there we go. We currently have 39,000 and 40,000 now. So batch size was 1,000. So that makes sense. And if we look at our logs again, they should now be at yeah 40%. So I think, yeah, the first one starts at 0%. So <laughs> highest would be 99. So that that matches perfectly. And yeah, as, as said, sort of as these uh, uh, batches will average around five seconds eventually, I think it will take six to seven minutes, maybe, maybe eight minutes or so to complete. Um, but I'm actually going to stop it because so delete, oh, sorry, delete job order. Let's delete it. Okay, and now let's modify that same job. And as I said, all we have to do, and, and this is, I think, also something that's, that's really cool, all that we have to do to make use of that cluster is just change the configuration in the, in the class. And, oh, by the way, I haven't shown sort of where this is in the class um, yet on, on this one. I'll, I'll show you um, when this is running right now. So for now, let's maybe go for, for eight shards. I'm not going to go for the full 12 yet, just for, for eight for now. Um, and then let's apply that job again. And uh, the, the job, by the way, um, first, oh, I need to delete the job. Um, no, I think it already did. Yeah, already did, so I can apply it. Uh, the job itself will delete every uh, V8 class. Um, so it, it always starts basically. So if we look at the pods, it's already running again. That's nice. So let's attach to it. And now you can see this is way faster already. So we're now talking about batch times they're taking, yeah, I don't know, 300 milliseconds or something, because we're now using a cluster of eight nodes, where previously we were only using a single node. So also let me go here again and show you. And look, we've already surpassed the, the other one. So um, yeah, this one, I think we can actually let that finish because it's going to, going to be finished very soon. So let's wait for, yeah, another, I don't know, 20 seconds or so. So funny thing, as I um, sort of tried this out, and, and this is also the explanation for why I went for eight shards right now, not for the full 12. Um, as I tried this out yesterday, uh, we found out that these batches are starting to become so large that the bottleneck right now, it's actually not VV8 itself, but the VV8 clients. So we tested with, this is running with the Go client because it's a bit uh, more efficient than the, the Python client. Um, but we're seeing right now that basically in the batch where you send the entire data, which in this case, it's a, a 300 dimensional vectors. So that's quite a lot of data that's being sent there. And you get the response. In the response, you get the same data back <laughs> because, um, well, it's just sort of the, the the idea of creating an object, and you get the same object back because some fields might have been uh, filled by by VV8, for example. Uh, and this is currently entirely done in JSON. And yesterday I uh, checked the size of I think a batch of ten thousand. This is just running a thousand. And for ten thousand objects, the batch was actually twenty seven megabytes. <laughs> and it turns out at twenty seven megabytes, just sending the batch over HTTP and sort of parsing the JSON is actually quite slow. So this is becoming the bottleneck. And this is basically um, yeah, sort of preventing the times from going down linearly. So if we run this same job again, so let's delete the importer and run it again, this time with the full 12 shards. So in Ideally, sort of from a VV8 perspective, now we're adding 50% more resources. So this should, in theory, uh, speed it up uh, even faster. But it doesn't actually because the bottleneck right now is the, the client. 
So um, that's why I picked these these steps of sort of one, eight, and now twelve because between one and eight, it's it's still more or less linear. But as we sort of add more power to this cluster, <laughs> yeah, the the client becomes the bottleneck. So let's keep seeing. Okay, I'll apply my job again and take a look at it. Okay, this time it landed on a note that didn't have the the image locally yet. It seems so it actually has to. Yes, no loading, uh, but now it's already running. That's good. So if we attach to the logs, that one again, and you can see it, it is a bit faster, um, but yeah, it's definitely not 50% faster. So right now there is um, yeah, sort of a, a saturation in this example, which is in no way representative, but just for, for, for this particular um, case. Um, sort of around uh, eight no eight nodes in this case. Um, so let's see. I think the total time on the other one was fifty two, and yeah, this is barely any faster. This is forty eight. So uh, adding fifty percent more resources in this case didn't actually pay off. Uh, but as said, this is something that's currently uh, the limit is is in the client. So we measured the time of sort of from VBA's perspective how much work it has to do as opposed to the clients, and we're seeing that the clients are the biggest overhead, which is something we can easily fix uh, various ways, compression, um, maybe a binary protocol on, on the request. Um, what would probably also help is just to make the, the response maybe a bit more efficient that the vector would only be sent if the flag is set or something like this. Um, but yeah, in the cool case is the VV8 cluster itself. It still, yeah, it, it still works <laughs> very nicely even with 12 nodes. One other thing that I wanted to show on this particular one before we wrap up, um, I said the, um, yeah, the sharding configuration in my script wanted to show the effect that that actually had. And um, let me quickly, do I still have the IP here? No, I need to get that again. Get service. Let's get that one. And demo class. Here you can see um, that because I set the, the shards to, to 12 in my script, that here they ended up at 12. And if we were to change that again to a different value, let's just go look for the job and let's maybe set that back to one and apply it again. And now we need to wait for it to actually run. It's already running, that's cool. So now we can look at the class again and now we can see that it's just one. So that was basically the, the change that I was doing. Uh, point being that just in your configuration, in your schema configuration that you're already sending, you now basically have control over how uh, that class should be spread um, amongst your, your VV8 nodes. Yeah, that wraps up the second live demo. And as you can see here, I'm still importing now on a single uh, node much slower now than it was on the on the cluster. Um, yeah, before we move to, to questions, because we have, still have a bit of time, I just want to very quickly walk you uh, through, through the new documentation because, well, it's actually not new documentation, it's just a few new pages in the architecture section. Um, but yeah, as we said, we have the, the roadmap, which I talked about in the beginning already, and horizontal scalability is now released. Uh, next up is replication, which I think uh, the benefits we outlined before. Uh, so if we go to the overview, we have this this uh, graphic here, which I think is also really nicely shows how, oh, well, that's, oh, there we go. Um, shows sort of how everything ties together in VV8, especially with regards to modules. Um, also, yeah, from a scaling perspective, so if you were to run a module that needs uh, GPUs, for example, that module runs in its own container. So you could run that on separate hardware, um, which is GPU accelerated for the VV8 core, which is now horizontally scalable, as the stateful part is completely CPU only. Speaking of CPUs, let me zoom in a bit again, of CPUs and um, resources, we also added a guide on um, sort of how to how to uh, size your cluster or how to size your nodes. That's that's the same thing. So a question that, that I received today was, if I'm running VV8 in a cluster, 
um, how does that change my, my um, yeah, sort of, I think it was specific to memory, but in general, my, my resource requirements. And the answer is it, it really shouldn't. So basically if you're running with 24 CPUs before, and now you say, I wanna run on three nodes, then you should be able to run three nodes of the, uh, eight CPUs each, and the same is, is true for, for memory. Uh, but in general, we have this new section in documentation, um, yeah, sort of outlining the role of CPUs. What do they do? Why would you add more CPUs? Same for, for memory. Um, also something about, um, yeah, potential bottlenecks, um, how garbage collection in Go would affect your VV8 um, thing, what you can do to potentially reduce memory requirements if it's too high, uh, caching vectors on disk, um, the role of GPUs, et cetera. So this is a really cool new guide that should definitely help you. And of course, uh, the one on horizontal scalability with everything that we talked about right now. Um, what other points didn't we? Oh yeah, there are two two more points that I didn't actually three more points that I didn't talk about at all. Um, one is resharding. So resharding is also something that um, we put in the dynamic scaling uh, milestone. So it means right now the shard count is immutable. You cannot change it. Um, the reason for this is basically. No, no, actually, the, the reason for it is mostly that it's going to be in a later milestone. <laughs> but uh, still, there is something that you need to, to keep in mind with regards to resharding. Um, this HNSW index that we built up, you can't just cut that in hot half or cut that into individual parts. So basically, a resharding process is basically a new import. So what that means is sort of in the worst case, this is not how it, it is in VV8, but this is how it could be. Let's say you're going from one shard to two shards and you would have to sort of build up everything again. That would essentially just mean you need to re-import your entire data. What we have in VV8 is a virtual shard system, which is very much inspired by, we, we talked about this in depth in the, um, in the architecture meetup where we went through all the, the theory, which is inspired by uh, Cassandra's uh, virtual nodes. And the idea here is that basically we assign data uh, or we assign yeah, objects basically to a virtual shard, which then belongs to a physical shard. And if we change the number of physical shards, um, only those virtual shards or only some virtual shards basically have to be moved. So this means that if you go, for example, from four shards to five shards, you don't want to have any movement between the four existing shards. The only movement you want to have is from those four shards to the new shard. So this is this example here. Um, that if you have, so, so here we have, if it takes, as an example, if it took you 60 minutes to import your data into four shards, and now you're adding a fifth shard, um, then each shard will have to transfer 20% of its data, which means that the resharding process would take roughly 20% of the import time, which would be uh, 12 minutes in this case. So important to keep in mind, resharding, it is on the roadmap for dynamic scaling. Um, or is it actually, I think here it says it's, it's sort of, it's on the roadmap, but not even in that point. It's just something that, that we can do in the future, but there is a cost to resharding because of the HNSW index. Uh, next point that I did not talk about, about yet, and I also won't talk about right now for more than a sentence or two. Um, how do nodes discover each other? Uh, basically, you can see that in, when I showed the services here, there is a VV8 headless service, which is part of the new um, of the new uh, uh, Helm chart that we deployed or that we released today. And basically, what that does is it just resolves the IPs of the individual nodes, and then the nodes themselves, uh, yeah, they they use that information to communicate. And as long as as any node in the cluster has contact with any existing nodes, they will discover each other because they are using a gossip protocol or, or gossip-like protocol. And this is not something we invented um, and also not something we implemented, uh, but something we uh, just are using a HashiCorp's member list uh, Go library for this. And, and this is also that this gossip uh, protocol also would communicate stuff like uh, failure scenarios, for example. So if one node is um, assumed dead, then basically that news will spread like, like gossip. Um, yes, this is all, the, the important thing to say about this is basically that you don't have to do anything as long as you use the, the VV8 Helm chart. So as you could saw, uh, as you could see with the, um, with the first example where we started from scratch, having nothing but a Kubernetes cluster, all you have to do is configure the replicas and it will be deployed. 
Uh, next thing is also something that we don't have in right now, but that um, yeah might make sense in the future, uh, which is something such as node affinity. So as I said before, I could tell VBA to only create one shard or eight shards, and these one or eight shards were uh, basically distributed among those 12 nodes, physical nodes, Kubernetes pods that we had, um, but we can't currently control which nodes should uh, get something. So this is something that we might add in the future, like a label or a rule, for example. So let's say if you had uh, async node sizes, um, some nodes bigger than others, then you might want to um, sort of uh, put more charts on one node, or maybe you have more critical nodes or something like that. So in the future, we might add labels here. And if, you're, if you've used Kubernetes before, I think the term node affinity is also one that, that they use. So that's definitely um, inspired by, by Kubernetes and meant to, to work with Kubernetes. Yeah, other than that, we, we've talked about the, the stuff that isn't implemented yet, which is basically what is on the roadmap. So replication will be part of the next release. Probably we'll have another meetup where we can show that. Something that I'm already looking forward to, to show is um, yeah, actually putting query load on the cluster and getting it to a point where um, it's maxed out and then just adding new nodes and um, yeah, and increasing the query uh, load or, or the query capability once we have replication. So that is currently under development. Well, it, it is going to be after today because today we finished um, the horizontal scaling without replication milestone, which is ready to use. As you can see, 1.8, I think it's currently not yet in the configurator. Let me check. Actually, I don't have to check. I, I know that we haven't put it in yet, but um, let me nevertheless demonstrate. Yeah, it's, it's not here yet, uh, but we'll add it tomorrow probably as a, as a release candidate. Yeah, that wraps up the live demo. I actually wanted to, to go to this one. That wraps up the live demo.